it looks so good. And uh, I even saw like a shooting star just above the comet. What a night, what a night. So right now I am just in the perfect position. I have planned everything and even though you plan everything, yeah, it of course just falls apart. So right now, sadly, the comet Neowise is just way too far up in the sky. I simply just do not get the impact I want and the sky is just way too full of clouds and yeah, they, they take up, yeah, they're too distracting, sadly. So. I, yeah, I don't really get what it is I, I came for, uh, for this specific location. Sadly, the next days the comet will just be further and further up in the sky. So, yeah, that was it. That was it for this location. Uh, it will probably never ever happen again. So that was a complete fail. Seeing the comet is easy, but you need to put in an effort to get the photograph you have in mind. Therefore I had to do a bit more preparation. I needed to find a location where I could create a proper perspective compression as to make the comet appear large and the foreground appear small. Based on the experience I got the first three nights of photographing the comet, I knew I needed a distance of at least 300 meters to the foreground. The foreground also needed to have an altitude of about 47 meters relative to the position of the camera as to create an angle of about 9 degrees, which is a little less than the altitude of the comet above the horizon on this specific night. I used the program Stellarium to find the exact position of the comet. It's available for free for desktop computers and for about 10 US dollars you can get the plus version for mobile. In addition, there could not be any vegetation in the line of sight and all of these factors only worked if I could face north. In a country as flat as Denmark, finding a location where all these criteria are met is actually really hard. I scoured Google Earth and looked at some typography maps, but nothing really stood out. The angle was either wrong, not steep enough, or trees would obscure the view. But then it dawned upon me that the answer was straight in front of my nose. So there's nothing like a few fails that actually make you learn. And tonight, I think I got it. So I have been like calculating with angles and distances and put it into triangles. And yeah, and I've, I've found out that this place, which is actually very close to my home and, and where I, I went to school, might actually work out. So we have one big hill over here and we have another big hill over there. And these two hills are some I have visited quite a lot uh, throughout my life, but onto the comet. So the idea is of course to have myself standing up there on the top of the hill, this hill or the other hill. And I actually have quite a lot of opportunity to move both a little bit further forward and a little bit further backwards in case that my calculations are a little bit off. The view from up there is also quite famous, so I just want to show that to you first. <sighs> that, was, uh, that was harder than expected. <laughs> so the view from up here is absolutely gorgeous, but uh, I'll probably have to run up and down a few times tonight. But you can see right now my camera is down there and luckily there are no people here so I can just leave it. But as you can see here, so I'm right now on one of the hills. The top of the other hill is over there. I might get over there too. The thing is 
I think it's a good idea yeah, to have a little bit of wiggle room. And before it gets all dark, the comet ought to be out. So I can prepare a little bit more like on location. But I think, I think the calculations are good. So right now it's getting dark rather fast. It's like 20 minutes past 11-ish. And I'm basically just walking between the two hills right now. I found a star, I'm pretty sure it's the one called Capella, which I can use as a reference. So I can actually plan my compositions beforehand and my calculations with the angle and, and so forth really works out completely. I can simply just follow the road along here between the two hills. And yeah, uh, there's a cloud on the way, but there seems to be clearance on the other side. So I'm not completely panicking yet. And so far so good. There are no Noctilucent clouds. So hopefully tonight I can get a clear shot of this comet. Finally, I almost dare not hope, but uh, I'm not too pessimistic right now. So the comet is really out now and right now I'm simply just time-lapsing it. At this very moment the comet is as close to the horizon as it will be tonight. I've come a little bit further back from the road but not too much and the comet is just above the hill. So when I'm done with this time-lapsing and I'm waiting a little bit more uh, so it gets a little bit more dark and uh, then I will try to get the shot I have imagined with myself up on the hill and have the comet in the background. What I have figured out right now is that I will have to focus stack this shot, which is a little bit problematic when there's like 300 meters between myself posing up there and the camera. Sadly, Sophie is not with me tonight. So yeah, I have to do all this myself. So I will put it into time-lapse mode and make a time-lapse while I'm walking around up there. And then I will come back down and take some photos of the comet. And somehow stitch it together and respect the focal length and so forth. But uh, yeah, it's basically just about getting to it. <laughs> this looks so scary. So I've just been up on top of the hill and right now I'm just hammering off like a, a lot of shots of the comet being in focus. So I am just collecting data right now. I know that astrophotographers take a lot of photos and then they stack them and they also take what's called dark frames at uh, the same settings as they are taking the normal pictures. So yeah, I'm just hammering off and I will see what I will do with it when I uh, come back home. But uh, yeah, it's working out. It looks so good. And uh, I even saw like a shooting star just above the comet. What a night, what a night. It's working out. So I got the shot I came for. So after I've got all these photos here, I'll just uh, start. Uh, playing around and try all sorts of other compositions.
All right, all right, all right. So dawn is breaking way, way too fast. And uh, yeah, I'm going here blinding myself so I can talk with you guys. I am on my way up to the top of the other hill. And uh, of course, now a cloud is coming in. <laughs> it's a little bit hectic this year, but I have got the photos that I mainly wanted. So right now I am actually just playing around, but it would be nice, you know, to get as much out of it as possible. So yeah, just on my way up. It's quite hard this year, but it's, it's so much fun. This is, yeah, this is the best part of photography. You have got your shot, you're just playing around, then it's fun. So what an absolutely fine night this has been. I finally managed to get some photos of that comet without some noctilucent clouds in front. I planned it out from home, it worked out, and I'm very confident with the data gathering I've been doing here. So now it's just back home, sleep, and uh, let's see what I can put out of these files tomorrow. Uh, I can't wait to see them. So a few words about the editing. The first photo with the shooting star was separated into six different exposures, each with a shutter speed of 1.6 seconds. Since my interval between the photos was two seconds, it left several gaps in the shooting star when I stacked the exposures in Photoshop. I used the original exposures, light and blending mode, and some masking to fill out those gaps. With an ISO of 6400, the noise was quite severe, so I used the night mode in Denoise AI from Topaz Labs to clean up the photo. The background is slightly out of focus since I was focused on myself posing for this session, but I thought it would be fun to show the photo. The next shot here I stacked in a program called Sequita. There are different stacking softwares out there for astrophotography based on your computer system. It is a stack of 100 photos with 100 dark frames to get a nice and clean photo of the comet. I also stacked and blended several exposures off the foreground as to get a relatively noise-free gradation from the background to the foreground. After all the blending I only had to do some minor cleanups and add some contrast. This photo with the tree went through the same stacking process as the previous, but due to the stacking of so many photos the foreground tree wasn't acceptably sharp. I had to clone out the tree of the background comet photo and add it back in with a separate and sharper foreground layer. I also had to add in a separate figure of myself from the second session as I did not have time to run all the way back up the hill again. I used the previous photo to make sure I got the size of myself exactly right as it is important to me to respect the perspective. An interesting observation I did in the post-processing of the photos is how the comet changed position relative to the background stars and they are only taken about 15 minutes apart. I tried to overlay the stars to my best ability in Photoshop and it's obvious there is a change in perspective. Now that is fascinating. The final photo is also a blend and an interesting one. Due to dawn breaking fast, I lost a lot of the contrast between the comet and background, which made the comet seem very small and dim compared to earlier photos. I also placed the comet a bit lower behind the foreground, since I slightly miscalculated how fast the comet was rising in the sky due to Earth's rotation. Because of all this, I decided to use the previous blend of the comet exposures in this photo. As you can see here, I overlaid the layers and matched the stars to make sure I respected the perspective and size of the comet. You can also see how much more dim the comet looks when there is an hour between photographing it. 
I used several exposures for the foreground with the light painted tree and myself. I stacked them in Photoshop with some masking and lightened blending mode of the layers. And I also decided to remove the foreground tree on the right. It was simply just in the way. If you want to learn about composition in landscape photography, I have two ebooks that are easy to read with tons of examples. There are links to both of them down in the description. Thank you so much for watching. If you want to see even more, be sure to subscribe to the channel. If you haven't seen part one of these videos, be sure to check that one out too. And as always, I would highly appreciate both a like and a comment.